brimming over with resources and really with the conversation we're gonna have today, because we're really gonna go into two rounds of conversation that I think we, we're hearing the start of already. But before we do that, people mentioned some resources and I think Linda was capturing some of them. Is that correct, Linda? Is that what you're writing up in the Kiko chat? Uh, I captured yeah. a little something, but let's all participate because I don't always catch everything. Yeah. I've already so, missed some, some things. I'm just going to jump in kind of as participant more than facilitator. I posted already because I got in this room early some resources I just wanted to share. I'll just walk through them real quick. We don't have a whole lot of time to discuss these, although we can bring them into our discussion. But the first link is the Climate Interactives link, where they've got now a really cool tool that you can explore many ways around carbon footprint. Much more sophisticated, much more fun. You can play with changes you can make. Um, and then uh, I copied a Salon article, which really talked about um, taking a different look at, the, at what we learned and what we need to take away from um, Harvey and of course now uh, Irma. And in that article, this guy named, but you all may know Alex Stefan, who's a futurist, who it turns around has been around a lot, but he, had, he used this phrase, which he's been using now for about three years, which really grabbed me called predatory delay. And it, it, it's a concept that really grabbed me because it explains some of the, the intrusions of the large fossil fuel companies and other places that have a lot of control of the structure of our system right now as it's operating and yet are moving slow as molasses so they can still make as much money as possible during this transition as they talk about how we need to transition there. So I love the phrase predatory delay. I thought it was robust. And then below that, you can read it later. He had some other things to say about the importance of vision and these three, there's three bullets there of what we need to do. We need to master three tools. And I thought these, although they're a little abstract, could be things we could discuss in a future meeting. So again, we're, we're, I, I'm not going to, I'm inviting you to cut and paste this, take it home and, and look at it at later. If anything resonates, maybe we can bring it back. How about, I know resources were already mentioned. Is there anything else that you really want people to know about? Something that's coming up or a book or an article? Yeah, Marty. Yeah. I have something. Am I on? Yes, you are on, Sarah. Okay, great. And then I'll let you well, one, I mentioned to everybody, Naomi Klein's new book, if you haven't already read it, um, No is Not Enough. I've only read the first half, but um, I can say that he frames our situation in an overview of the systems analysis of, of how this has taken place, both economically and politically. Um, it, so it's a it's looking at our political situation, but of course, it, it helps us understand much more thoroughly the role of the fossil fuel industry in getting us to where we are on all levels. It's one of the best overall systemic analyses that I've seen. So I really strongly recommend it. And I'm working through it myself, but I, I would love it if there were a way we could talk about it together down the road. Maybe that could be maybe that could be a focus. Mm -hmm. I, I read it, but I feel like I need to go back and read it. As you said that, it's like I just read too many things. So. Yeah, I read it too. I wouldn't mind talking about it. Well, I have something I just posted in the notes, uh, which goes back to what I was talking to you about with respect to community rights. Um, these are three uh, fairly concise uh, interviews with Paul Cienfuegos that I found much better than anything else I've seen so far on right. it. So. Um, that's a resource if any of you are interested. Thank you. Anybody else have um, have something? Jim, yes. Hi. Um, so I, I sent Linda, I sent you a chart, and yes. I don't know how to I, get it. Uh, what I can do, John, uh, I mean, Jim, I'm sorry. I'm going to do a share screen right now and bring it up. I didn't know how to post it, but I'd like to show yeah. everybody what you sent me. Okay. Uh, of course, that means I've got to get it on my desk first. So hold on. Uh, so it's about the active hope process and uh, it outlines uh, enhancements to that process. Enhancements beyond uh, uh, Joanna Macy's work. 
Yes. Okay. Here it is. Here it is. Okay, here I go. I'm just going to do a quick share screen so you all can see it. It's pretty cool. I didn't know how to. Are you, can you send it then too, Linda? What I can do is I'll forward it on to you all and I'll put it on the Kiko Chat site so you can look at it later too. So this is what it looks like. Do you want to? You know, why don't yeah. you? Okay. So all kinds of resources and lots of Joanna Macy's work, it looks like. Yeah, and that Paul uh, San Fuegos, who I'm working with, uh, is a trained Joanna Macy facilitator, oh. as am I, actually. Oh. Good Great. stuff. Okay, so I'll try to get that out to you all and put it on Kiko Chat later. Great, thank you. Any other resources we want to get out? Lynn, did you have us on full screen? I lost my Kiko Chat screen on my computer did you um i haven't done anything you should be able to just uh get in and out of full screen on your own okay i maybe i just have to hit escape yeah hit escape is what i just did right and then i always have to go back to where you all are or i have to go back to where the kiko chat notes are find my way back there we are okay so i'm back now fully <laughs> Go around. Okay, I'm not back yet, but that's okay. Let me just try. Are you trying to get back to the whiteboard? Yeah, I just wanted to be able to see the whiteboard if I could, because that was giving me some orientation, but it's not that essential. Well, so I think we're done with sharing resources. I don't, I don't need to see it. I don't think it's essential for me to see it right now. So, so, um, so we have about an hour to talk amongst ourselves more and then we still have time to learn about the Council of the Uncertain Human Future and and figure out our next step for our next call. But the way I thought of this was two rounds of conversation. Um, and and one, the first one, I and we've already started it with our check-in, but I really wanted the first one to be more personal, not so much wearing our work hat. But there's so many events and this is the, the round is really about uh, reflecting on this moment in time. And the question is, what is personally grabbing you about current events as you do climate work? So this is about your, your personal handling of this, which we're already on the territory. And I wanted, even though I know we're totally in the midst of seeing these storms and all of the things that are happening with the storms, they're, they're going to be big in our minds, but I'm inviting you and I'm going to ask all of us, we're going to take about a, a moment here to just personally collect ourselves, to just let yourself sit and think about what is coming up for you about what's going on in the world right now that is having some sort of an effect on you. And then we're going to go in around and share and we'll and then we'll have some discussion after we've all had a chance to share some. So just take, just take a, a moment here. Just, just collect yourself and let your mind contemplate what's been coming at you recently in the news, through friends, in your community. So I thought what we'd do, because there's quite there's a number of us on the call, is if we could try to limit our, our comment, what I'd like you to do is share one or two things that have come up for you and, and really how they are affecting you personally. Um, and we might just want to be aware of time a little bit. So I'd say, you know, taking a couple minutes, maybe, maybe if there's seven of us, I think. So if we take, we have two rounds. If we take two minutes each, we'll have time after to have a response to our whole response. So maybe we'll go in reverse order if that's all right. If we might go in reverse order of how we came on the call. And Rosa, that would start with you. Would you? With you, Marty. Pardon? Start with you. You were the last one to speak. No, she, well, she was the first one. You shared her. I, I was suggesting we go in reverse order of how we came on the call, just to change it. So that would be 
um, Rosa and then Jim and then Linda in that order. So. Okay. Um, I'll just say that uh, what's affecting me personally uh, with regard to climate change, I'm just struck by um, you know, it just feels like it's never a good time to talk about climate change. Like right now it's not a good time because there's all these people who are impacted by the hurricane and I kind of get that. And, but then tomorrow it won't be a good time because everybody will be on to something else. And it kind of reminds me, there's a, there's an old joke about the, uh, the farmer who had a, a leak in the roof of his barn and, uh, you know, when it was raining, he couldn't go out and fix it because it wasn't, because it was raining, and when it wasn't raining, he couldn't go out and fix it because it wasn't leaking right then. So it's just, um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I guess I'm finding it a little depressing to feel like here's this thing that is clearly connected with climate change, and yet it's, it's not acceptable to talk about the climate change connections at the moment in some circles. I mean, I have a lot of family in Florida, et cetera. So that's it. Okay. Thank you. I think we go next to Jim. So Jim, what's, what's grabbed you and how has it affected you? Um, as I said, I, I'm a little bit detached from climate change. Um, I am very concerned about the coastal cities across the globe and uh, rising um, uh, water levels and uh, locally uh, I've been active um, I guess I might have said before we we took our dam down in um, Exeter New Hampshire it was a mill pond a mill and uh, we had a, a dam free event. Can you imagine that? And I made buttons for everyone. So that's about it. Okay. I guess who is next? Was that Linda? That I think it's next? me. Yeah. Well, building on what Rosa said, I mean, I've been just, as I said, my check and just amazed that you know, we have this idea that we shouldn't be talking about climate change. So I noticed today in a news um, show that the mayor of Miami was quite outspoken. <laughs> and I think the question to the mayor was, well, do you, he was a Republican, by the way. And the question to him was, um, well, do you want Trump to actually um, say he was wrong about climate change? <laughs> and he said, oh, no, 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 it's not that. <laughs> it's that I, I'd like another explanation. If it's not climate change, then why are we being hit with two, you know, category four or five hurricanes <laughs> back to back? So um, actually, I, I've been, um, except for Pruitt's, you know, or I don't mean Pruitt, who, who, who was the guy? No, yeah, it was Pruitt who said, let's not worry about climate change, EPA guy. Um, I've been actually seeing a lot more willingness to talk about it. Um, McCain's talking about it. Um, it just seems like local newscasters are much more open about it. I, I actually think that the, the public consciousness is rising about climate change, and it, I think we're very ripe for um, a movement to get started, a grassroots movement, again, which is why I'm so excited about community rights. So I'm, I'm feeling the uh, zeitgeist is, is uh, moving in the direction of, of saying we need to do something, and we need to do something now. I mean, I'm even seeing it abroad, you know, uh, right, I think it was today, they're having this huge rally in Spain, you know, the, Separatists. I mean, I'm seeing I'm seeing energy on the left kind of rise up. Even even the healthcare thing. You know, Bernie Sanders introducing that into Congress and having 16 people um, support that bill. I mean, I'm seeing sort of a groundswell back to the left where it needs to go. And of course, climate change is part of that uh, swing left. So I'm I'm encouraged not by the event so much, but by the zeitgeist change I'm seeing. Thank you. I think we're on to Sarah. Okay. Um, I don't know, Marty, whether I heard this question right, but I kind of, as soon as you asked it, I started thinking about how deeply depressed I am um, about our country. And, and then 
the way that the energies that are fueling um, our current situation, the racism, the misogyny, the strategic planning on the part of a number of interests to bring this uh, government into being, um, the existence of similar forces in places like India with the death of this remarkable journalist, Gauri Lankesh, um, who was just murdered um, for basically by, by um, the equivalent of all right Hindus. Um, and the Charlottesville episode, I, I feel as though that was the most, one of the most frightening things I've seen in my adult life. Um, and the fact that that was then given permission, um, I feel it. So I'm sorry, Linda, I just am saying all these things that are kind of the opposite of feeling hopeful. Um, and I, I, I think that we're in a systemic, you know, situation that we really need to take on systemically. And that's a very, very big job for us all. Um, the, it, I, I wanted to mention a couple of the ways I see it happening in specific. I spoke with one of my colleagues at the National Center for Atmospheric Research this week, and quietly they fired all the people who are doing human dimensions work at this center, which is the United States Center of Climate Research. Um, the other thing that's going on is the NASA leadership has just been taken over by this, what's his name, Bridenstein, I think, Bridenstein. Um, and so, again, another place that does some of the most powerful research for us on this work, and that I rely on for the vital signs of the planet, is now taken over by a climate denier. So the things that are going on at the, at the sort of... Um, uh, what would you say, the, the non-public arena, the things that they are able to do um, are, and we know this from Pruitt and all the things that he's doing with the EPA. Um, there's so much underway right now that is undermining everything that we have accomplished and want to continue to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So all of that said, I'm all for positive <laughs> approaches you know, and for us to figure out how we do this. But I think you basically were saying what's personally grabbing you. And um, it's being in this toxic space of, of uh, these forces that have been on the rise. And yes, they will dissolve eventually in some way. But I'm very affected by the rising toxicity. Thank you. Mm. I'm going to chime in next because I came in after Mark and Sharon Joy and uh, I asked, I wanted this, this was very selfish of me to put this question on, but you all are kind of, I'm finding some resonance here because I have been feeling very fragile lately um, and somewhat overwhelmed because I feel like I could stay in the lane of climate change for a long, long time and suddenly that lane just split open and everything's happening, you know, from DACA to Charlottesville to um, feeling like we've got this president that could actually get us into a nuclear war. Um, so, so there's a certain feeling that I can't deny. I think we can, I can find places of hope, but the, 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 I wanted a safe place to be able to say to someone <laughs> that I can't deny this overwhelming feeling of the human species on this planet is lots of tornadoes everywhere and lots of and lots of pain um and i'll just share one personal story on the climate front because my husband and i talk about this a lot and this is this is affecting my emotional uh, anxieties as well which is the circus of donald trump um, is one thing, but the policies, as like Sarah was just talking, I have a friend that was just pushed out of the EPA, and I heard she spoke at a, one of our groups the other night, and basically she had been in charge of a Superfund site. What's happening now with Pruitt and the Superfund sites, well, it turns out I didn't know the Superfund sites had been defunded since 2010. So there's a mountaintop removal site, the Washoe Indians, 
reservation. They had mountaintop removal. There's all sorts of super fun stuff that's supposed to help these people. That was her project. And Pruitt came in and they decided they were gonna do lean engineering, lean social engineering, where you streamline everything and you just do some sort of a really narrowed process. They decided they were gonna test that out on the Superfund sites. And they decided to pick region nine, which is the most liberal region out here in California for you know the EPA. And basically all the meetings started and she wasn't even in them and she was the project manager for the Superfund site. So she, they offered early retirement and she took it with her heart breaking because um, she just realized I'm now truly in a place where I can no longer help. I can no longer help and be an inside EPA person trying to help. So that's a very concrete example also of some of the dismantling that's, that's going on that is just, um, that is heartbreaking. So that's enough. That's that's kind of when I open up my heart and my personal life. This is some of what pours in from the world. So Mark is next. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. This this story that you're talking about. Um, <clears throat> I, I suppose it's not. I'm not trying to say it's. Uh, I'm indifferent to it, but it's not new to me. Like we know this and these are all signs of systems collapsing. And I think what it's doing for me is, and I've had this experience before, it's saying that, um, you know, reasonableness, common sense, what we think should work, our, our hope in, in that uh, we've had to let go of and we're, we're in despair. I mean, I'm, I've, I've seen this. We, we have the knowledge, we know, we have the heart, we, we have the skills to deal with all of this. And we've got, we live in a system that is just blindly ignorant to use it. And so um, I, I'm touched by, by women like Joanna Macy and Margaret Wheatley, who, who actually say we, we have to go deeper into the despair and be able to ha hold that in our hearts. And I'm, I'm trying to learn to hold this capacity as well. The, the painfulness of this till we find the raw humanity that we need with each other, which comes up in these situations and which we're developing in our conversation here, to have the, the capacity to, to act. And, and one of the things last weekend with Margaret Wheatley that really touched me was that um, she says what, the, what she wants on her tombstone is, uh, is a saying that comes from other traditions, which is, um, we were together, I forget the rest. And, and she sees that uh, you cannot change systems. All you can do is be of service and uh, to love and care for the people you're with in this present moment. Uh, that she got a lot of pushback on that from people who are activists and trying to change things and what have you. And there's still a lot of churn in the community around that. Um, but, but I, but I get that. I think, I think we're going to experience more despair and pain, but uh, we have to learn to um, be open hearted enough to connect with each other. And, and it's, it's going to be, um, you know, fairly chaotic and very disruptive and uh you know the mold and the, uh, the the leaking houses and all sorts of things are going to be collapsing around us so uh, rather than being fearful of that um you know i just hold a space and, and i hope it's not just hope because she says hope and fear are actually the same dynamic um so it's you know when we're hopeful we're actually giving some of our agency away we, we actually you know have to uh go to really uncertain places in ourselves that uh, touch in our deep humanity. So um, this conversation is eliciting that in me and I don't know what the future is, but I, but I do feel a, a gratefulness for, you know, you as a group of people. I'm doing that in other groups that I'm with. Um, you know, I, I am uh, preparing myself to die. I've had this experience when I was younger. I, I did a lot of mountaineering and, I've I've been on the edge of a mountain on an icy ridge and felt if uh, if I lose my presence and connection to this moment, I could fall to my death. 
And actually, it brings you very alive when you live with death on your shoulder. So uh, I can feel myself uh, preparing for uh, the way I need to be. And this is a warrior spirit, but it's one of uh, the human spirit and deep love and compassion. Thank you. Sharon Joy. Well, while some people may not be able to talk about climate change, since I'm in the middle of it, <laughs> there is no such thing in Florida as somebody else's backyard because it's in our front yard, it's in our backyard, it's in our neighborhood, it's on our roofs. And I've been intrigued with a phenomenon of, of an imaginal uh, phenomenon to translate into a story, which you think about this whirling vortex of energy that literally wiped this peninsula. There's nothing standing that hasn't been touched by these winds, by these energies, and what an opportunity. I was talking with one of my friends who's had some damage in her garden and her home, who's an extraordinary uh, historian and actually writer about the goddess. Her name is Willow Lamont. She used to produce a magazine, a newspaper called Goddessing. And I said, I feel like it's an example of Kali, the anger of Kali. And she said, well, there's an, uh, a, an Aruba story of Oya, O-Y-A, that brings on these winds of change. And I think of that as going on here in Florida, I feel like it's an extraordinary gift because what was isn't anymore. And you know, my theme is a shift in consciousness. So to me, the lands have been cleared of what was before. And what we have now is an invitation um, to, to look in our relationships as this goddess tears up what was. Um, Willow was saying this is our relationships with ourselves and with our intimate partners. Do they need to be cleansed? She also said that in her garden, if you take care of the plants by pruning them, that they will grow strong. And if you don't, they will die it will outgrow. So I'm thinking that Irma brought us to cleansing to prune what was here. And for me, I've, I had already set the trail in motion by meeting with our deputy mayor about St. Petersburg convening the mayors of Florida to talk about climate change. And she emailed me the day before we ran into everybody doing something else that we'll get back to you after the storm. We love the idea. And the second idea we had in that meeting was that St. Petersburg become an official city of compassion. And that's part of the acceleration I'm observing. While we see the physical devastation around us, we're experiencing the extraordinary love that is accelerating here in Florida. The stories, one after the other, of person reaching out to person. So that's the part I focus on. And that to me is the invitation. And back to what Mark said, we plan to visit different regions of Florida through the rest of the year with the Drawdown Workshop. We will be working with the League of Women Voters to accelerate the courage of those mayors running for office and the congressmen running for office here in the state of Florida to stand up on climate change, doesn't matter what their party is. So we think that Irma has cleaned the place for us. So those are the things that I've been reflecting on before and during and after Irma's dance with us mm -hmm. right thank you and thanks all of you um i i'd like us to take a moment and we've heard a lot of different expressions of how the time are affecting us and i'm wondering if any of you had something jumped out at you that someone else commented on 
or any pattern among some of our comments that you'd want to see? Do you see an entry point here for what we're talking about when we talk at the personal level? So Marty, I'm going to need to go in a couple of minutes. I had said that I was only going to be able to be here for the, the first hour of this. Um, and then I, I was late. I got, uh, uh, anyway, I was very, very touched to be here. Um, one of the common themes I'm hearing is the value of being able to touch our painful and difficult feelings because it allows us to make it through and, and deepen. Um, I really appreciated the image that you share, share, share and enjoy about the hurricane um, clearing out and cleaning and the value of looking at our relationships. And um, this is not for now, but I just, I want to say it might is caught with your drawdown workshop. I'm not sure that I've um, really heard more about it before. Maybe that would be like something that you could share more details with us over email or something. So that's it for me. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you for being here for part of it. So did I see a hand from Sarah? Did Sarah, did you have? No, I was no. sending greetings to Rosa. Bowing. Thanks. Did I see something from Linda? Or, or I see Jim's hand and then Linda's. Uh, so Mark, um, I'd like to hear more about uh, Meg Wheatley and her, her idea about, well, being of service and doing things as I get it. Do you tell us more about that? Do you want to, do you want to do that now or, or yeah. we just, uh... Do it. I don't think go into a, I think if you can do it, give us a taste and direct Jim so we can keep the conversation going because we only have a few more minutes on this round. So maybe give a little bit more and then a resource. Uh, yeah, what really struck me is that uh, there was 40 people who were really uh, challenging her about uh, that view that you, you can't change the system uh, because she's done a lot of work inside systems and she's a Buddhist. And she, you know, I think she also very uh, uh, respects Joanna Macy's wonderful leadership in that space too. Mm -hmm. And um, she's done a lot of, she, her close friend lives in Houston and uh, has come to Australia to do work with, uh, you know, understanding how to deal with emergency response to bushfire. But she was also aware that her friend was in Houston with the, the storm there, the hurricane there. and. Um, Meg told a story of uh, just listening and supporting and being of service to this wonderful woman who deals with those things. And uh, I remember she said um, she, she'd probably been coaching her for some time and talking her, to her about how, how she can you know, be resourceful. But uh, she said she finished off the conversation by saying, uh, don't be a wilted flower. And uh, the woman who, sh who was in Houston said, Oh, I've spent this whole conversation with my head on the desk. <laughs> and she just felt like she needed to sit up and find her dignity. And one of the simple things Meg does is just help people find their connection and their dignity in their own body in the present moment. And um, Mark, does she have a new book out where she's dealing with any of this? Do you know? Maybe yeah, you can hear that. Yeah, she does. Okay, well, I'll, yeah. So. So I think it's just, uh, it's making it sort of sh uh, shrink down to just being of service and finding uh, your own presence and connection in amongst the storm. So I'll put some links up on the website about that. Thank you. So was this, Linda, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to um, express, I guess, a little bit more of my hope because it seems like I'm the one person here who's, you know, kind of sitting with, more hope. And I think it's because I've, oh gosh, I took, I took Joanna Macy's workshops many years ago. Um, I think we're talking six or seven years ago. Not that I've been, you know, depressed and in despair for that long, although I'd come in and out of my own despair about it. 
and really have felt like, why bother? You know, we're already above where climate change is obviously going in a positive direction. But there's something about touching this community rights work. I think because I have been so focused on uh, where people could start to feel empowered, because I know I've, I've felt incredibly disempowered in my climate change work. And so when I finally heard that there were actually communities that were winning in the legal courts, cases that would allow them to establish self-governance, it suddenly hit me. That's, that's where we need to work. We need to work locally. We need to develop our local connections with those in our community. We need to find out what is it we really want, not what we're fighting against, but what is it that we want? And I don't know, there's something there that hearken, heartens me to think that we're going to pull through. I mean, even if climate change eventually, I mean, it's coming, it's here, but there's something about reconnecting at that local level and in a way that really can create systemic change. So I, I, I just wanted to explain a little bit more why I'm more hopeful in that regard. Was there someone else that had a, a comment? I was gonna take off my facilitator hat and make a comment if, if that was okay. Um, I mean, to me, I appreciated this conversation. And to me, the phrase that comes up, there's a book called Standing in the Fire. Um, which is a, and to me that that is kind of um, the metaphor. And I appreciated Mark's comments about, I mean, to me, when I feel, and also I felt from Jim some sense of, I lost something in, in my focus on climate change. And the fact that we're on a journey and that this is work of standing in a fire. So it's, it's not finding hope and then living hopeful or, so my insight for this is that I need to acknowledge that I, that this is part of my lived experience right now. And that this is, goes with the territory. Mm -hmm. And really there's no way to, if unless I'm gonna just shut down my thinking, there's no way I can escape it. It's just, it is. So that's, that's kind of my meta comment on our, our conversation and what I heard. But I just, as we close this up and I, I want to ch I'm going to check in and see where we want to go next. I have a proposal. We may want to do something different. But any other insight or something you take away? Was this a significant thing that we did? Or how is it useful that we try to stay in the personal, not immediately run to our work. We try to stay with the personal as a way to honor our work, maybe. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on this? Yes, Mark. I can't remember what it, what it was, but uh, it's my experience when we sit in circle that um, often the, those of us who speak first are sort of tentatively trying to work out what we've got permission to talk about, especially when it's quite personal and maybe it could shape how other people perceive the conversation and we, and we want to build relationship and connection. And sometimes the things we're talking about um, build distance and fear and what have you so it's it's tentative work and we have to gently enter that space so i don't know what it was but there was something sarah in the way you um shared your story and it was probably halfway through our circle that sort of uh, opened something up for me and um you know i think that's a mutual exchange as we go around in circles to find those spaces where we can make it safe uh, and we connect with each other, even though the topic of conversation is quite challenging. So thank you for that. So any other final comment on this, or let me, let me tell you what we're going to do next and see how it feels with where we're sitting right now. <laughs> Um, the, the second round, which would again would be another go round, my, my notion of it was now to bring this to our work. Um, and, and I felt that it would be interesting to hear from each of us who we see sh that we seek to serve or who we see that we seek to impact in the work that we do. You know, who, who, is, who, is, who is it that we're seeking to influence or to serve? And then maybe say something about the current events that just got an earring caught. Let me take it out. I'm gonna do it. And then say something about how how current events are influencing our work and who we're trying to serve or influence. Does that make sense? I mean, I would be really interested to hear from all of you as to who you think you're 
you know, who you strive to serve or who you're striving to have an impact on. So um, is that, can I see if, the, if you're game for this or let's give it a go? Okay. Um, if you want, I'll start. Because I thought of this first and I'll, I'll stick my neck out and be the beginning of the circle. I love what Mark said. I think we want to have this be a spiral that goes deeper. But um, it's a really good question for me because I'm kind of in the middle of, you know, and, and again, I'm not doing paid work right now. So I don't have the safety of that lane that I wake up and I know that this is my mission because my organization pays me for this mission. So I still think that who I'm seeking to have impact on is policymakers. I think that's the, in terms of my work, that's really um, the main people that I'm seeking to impact. When I think of who I'm trying to serve, I, I see myself, it's less, it's vague to me. I, I'd really like to explore this more, but my intuition is that I just need to keep expanding my network and my circle and my movement and the connections and do it in a way that is supportive and of service to others. Um, so that we can do this this work together. Um, and so when I think of all the stuff that's going on right now and the fact that I am seeking to impact policy, um, I think this is where I really have um, a lot of grave questions because I've devoted so much of my time over the last years to try to... Um, affect the United States Congress. And, I, and while I still think that's a worthy cause, um, my heart is not in it as strongly as it was. So I think I'm really, given, that, given what I see happening with this administration and this Congress and the fact that, that there's still so much uh, split, um, I'm, it's causing me, a, I'm in a pause to really reflect on how I do best have impact. I feel that I'm able to have impact on policy and affecting policymakers more locally. I'm going to stop there. I do, I forget if I put it in my resources, but I read a really interesting article lately that, if time permits, I'll share, that does shed, if, if you all are doing policy work too, it'd be relevant, that I think sheds some light, at least in the United States, on some new ways to look at the, the political divide. But I won't, I won't go into it at this point. But, um, so working out for me, is there someone that just wants to go next or do you want me to just work from top to bottom, which on my screen, that would be Jim going next. <laughs> Jim, who do, you, who do you feel you're seeking to impact or to serve? I, I, uh, so the first is the uh, Unitarian Congregation of which I'm a member. And, um, and also we, we do have a very strong active, active hope group there including the newsletter coming out. And uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to serve them with ideas. And that was my chart with full of stuff, ideas. And uh, I take part in all our events and we protest a lot like good Unitarian. And uh, that's about it. Okay. Anything, is there anything shifting in your environment? I mean, you said you kind yes. of started yeah, to... I mean, away from one of the problems, of course, is, is affecting how you can do this work. What's happening yeah. right now in the world that's affecting... Well, we're... we're um, the Social Justice Committee is uh, working on racism, of course. And, um, and racism to me also includes anti-Semitism, as in the Charlottesville... Uh, and uh, I'm very concerned about that. And uh, I would say then the political situation is a great concern and that's keeping me very busy too. Thank you. Sharon Joy, how would you use this frame to describe what you're trying to accomplish? Well, um who, who I seek to serve is the community at large and to offer information that is real because I think hope without reality is, is, is empty like clouds. 
but uh, strategic actions that we've already shown are working. People are aware of them. They know about it. There are stories about it. So the, the people I look to serve are, are the larger community uh, to become more conscious and coherent. And I've been given a great gift as to be a co-host on a radio show that's going to start next week here in Tampa Bay, our community radio station. It's called Spotlight on Game Changers. And we've asked John Perkins to be our first guest because he is such a model of a person who started out as an economic hitman and then became a shaman and now is going to have a conference or for the second time on love. So he's truly an example. So while some of the people will be globally recognized, others are everyday people here in Tampa Bay. And I feel like that's a wonderful uh, um, service for people to hear that there is so much going on. And like you hear from me, based on quantum mechanics, based on a living systems theory, networks, uh, consciousness, uh, fields, all that science. And, and who I am influencing right now are policymakers. And I forgot to mention this in our talk earlier, because it's so powerful for me, really, something that's influenced me. I think I mentioned it on our last call. Coming back from Italy with two clear directions of climate and the doctrine of discovery, which are tied together because of the social injustice that has come through that doctrine of discovery. And, and they do tie together here in St. Petersburg, and we're doing that. The other um, service, I believe, is what people are crying for, which is these conversations, a place to sit down. I don't know if any of you saw Lucas Chaffee's video. He sent us the link to the news station up in Charlottesville. He decided to host conversations last Friday. And you can see the stores with tables and four chairs out in front of them. In Charlottesville, wow. In Charlottesville, yeah. And that's where I know people are longing to have these conversations because when we do things like that, that's what happens. But we're working with our leadership to bring us a formal implementation of creating a culture of conversational leadership in Tampa Bay. So these conversations can easily have an infrastructure to rise, arise within, whether it's a hurricane or it's a new pier or it's a mayoral election where people can come together with tools of listening, which is what we're experiencing and value in our community here. So that's mine, I would say. Great. Thank you. I think we're on to Mark. Yeah, um, Marty, your question about <clears throat> who um, serve and to impact and or to impact. Yeah, who, who am I serving and who am I impacting? Um, a lot of a lot of my work has been in organisational development, so I've always had this sort of view that um, people would lap it up and want to get more of it because it's so helpful. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, I felt like I've always had to modify because as you get more deeply into, or as I've got more deeply, it's it's very much around uh, self awareness and systems awareness. And and as I've done this work, uh, people have been. Um, reluctant really to you know especially senior people to to buy that um, insight because it actually is undermining the system that drives uh, the way our organizations work so I've always felt like we've had to sort of color or or sort of um, nuance the language around this work so that it's about effectiveness and you know innovation or whatever the the language people want to package it at to to get results 
So I've, uh, you know, in, in the last few years of my life, I've, I've had to, you know, reframe the work that I do. And so uh, I've offered it as a gift because uh, people don't want to buy it. Um, and so the dilemma of, of making a living in, in, the, in the system that we operate in uh, is very much real in my life. And, I, and I've felt that I've, I'm ta- I take a risk because uh, as I've, my awareness has increased, I, I can't go back and to live my life and work in a system where there's no heart or I can't uh, have conversations like uh, that, that challenge the fundamental beliefs that we're operating in. So to have integrity to do that, I think I can still do that in a compassionate way. So Mark, do you, but do you see that you're serving these organizations then? Is that who you would say that you are serving? Well, what I'm getting to, Marty, is that the first thing is I have to serve my own integrity. Okay. Uh, and so that is, um, that's, that's, that's the first place. And uh, when, when I make that stand, then uh, there's a lot of fear that comes up and the authenticity and vulnerability that I have to demonstrate. So if, if I serve my integrity, like I'm, I'm, I'm offering activities that uh, I'm not compelling people to come, and, but I'm making an open invitation for them to come. So I'm hosting a ULAB with others, a co-created ULAB in, in my city. So I'm quite excited about that. But I'm also aware that there's no um, guaranteed outcome. So I want to be of service to my community and to my politicians and to my bureaucrats and to the corporate people. But I've also let go of attachment to outcome on that. So, uh, so really, um, there's, there's a sort of attention in all of that and it gets back to my integrity in the end. And uh, will, will, I, will I keep standing up or will I let go of it? Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe, I mean, I could explore it some more, but maybe that's enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Linda. Oh, well, I feel like I'm in such a different space. Um, I guess um, the people that I'm serving now, I'm, I'm continuing to um, work within this Architecture 2030 group um, because it is a local effort. I'm, uh, I'm on the executive committee and it, it feels, you know, like I, I, I see how the meetings are being run and they're horrible and I want to help, and, but I'm not the ED. And so I'm, you know, I'm dealing with the, the, the politics of just being in an organization. And, um, but, you know, nonetheless, I'm doing what I can do to help this organization because I do think it's effective, uh, it can be effective in uh, Tucson in terms of lowering um, CO2 levels there. So there's a part of me that feels good about that. So I'm serving the people in that organization and hopefully I'll serve building owners um, in Tucson. And that, that feels good. I'm a building owner. I, I kind of relate to it and it's something I can do. It's one thing very practical that I can do. Um, the other thing that I'm doing, I've made a commitment to work with Lucas Chaffee. Um, I, I really do believe that if he has, uh, if he can, if he can perfect the user interface a little bit more and if there's training, I really do think that this digital platform that he's put together can be so helpful, even in climate work. So, um, I'm working now with, um, four or five other facilitators and we're going to help Lucas try to really get that system to work. I can see Sharon Joy saying it. It still has some bugs in it, so we need, we need to help him. So I'm serving that community because I think it has the capacity, even in climate change work, to really help communities connect deeply with each other, even though we're not together uh, in person, face-to-face. So that's becoming a bigger part of what I'm doing and what I'm serving. Um, I'm also involved in getting this, uh, it's called the Academy for Professional Dialogue uh, off the ground. That makes me feel very good. Uh, it's one reason I'm going, Sarah, over to England. And I, um, I found a guy over there I'm so excited about. Uh, his name is uh, Oliver Escobar. And he has done amazing work with dialogue and deliberation um, in citizen engagement work. He's really uh, very um, hooked into the Scottish parliamentary system. So I'm so excited to meet with him to find out what he's doing. He's, he's developed a lot of really nifty resources. I want to, I'm just viewing my time overseas um, uh, with a lot of 
you know, um, eagerness because I think uh, getting the school started will mean that what I've been focused on so much in my life, Bone Dialogue, uh, it will be a place for people to get training, to get resources. And so it won't die out. It seems like you know, Bohm and others have put dialogue together. And I know you know this, Sarah. I just finished the amazing book you put together on all the dialogic processes. Oh, so good. I wish I had written that. It was just beautifully written. I'm Thank so you. excited to learn more about Another what you resource doing. that we need to have in our list. Oh, it's an amazing resource. Just beautifully written. And I want to hear more about what you're doing with Dialogue at Clark. Um, anyways, I'm excited that... Um, there, there will be some place you can go to get actual training and in an ongoing way around dialogue. Because as we're all saying, if we don't learn how to change how we talk and how we are with each other, we'll never get to the deeper issues. Um, and then, of course, the last thing, which I keep, yeah, it's community rights work. Because for me, it just pulls it all together. Because communities, once they start to understand why they have not been empowered, then they're going to need something like dialogue and deliberation to help them figure out what kind of communities do they want to create for themselves, not what they're against. I mean, we can say we're against climate change, but until we get clear on how we want to be together in community, locally, nothing's really going to change. So I think that's the bigger, I guess, I don't know, that's what I want to serve. I want to help people learn how to actually ask those questions and I see this community rights as a possible avenue for that work to take place. And I haven't seen that before. I've been wondering, what am I doing in my climate work? And now I can kind of see, ah, this could be, this thing could go viral and there will be lots of communities waiting for people like us to help lead that effort. So I'm, I guess, I guess that's it in a nutshell. Great, thank you. Sarah. Um, ah, Marty, thank you for this question, which I have to say, um, I, I could ask you more questions about it. I, I, it does raise my question of what are the assumptions behind the question? You know, are we serving uh, more specific audiences or is there a larger purpose we're serving? And that's where I immediately go. Um, it, there was no agenda here. It was really wherever we wanted to take it in our minds. Yeah. 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 It was, it was good that way. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I, I have this more specific things that I'm doing, which are thinking about um, this kind of reckoning and the, the situation our young people in a university or college are in and um, what does that mean for those of us who are uh, responsible for creating these communities of learning and um, exploration and, and how do we do that in a way that is real in these times and so that whole question specifically played out at Clark um, but meaning it to be a model for what it means to educate in these times. So that's one audience for the way I'm thinking for the work I, I do at Clark on a New Earth Conversation, which is now becoming a New Earth community. And there's a website if people are interested in, in knowing more about that. Um, and, and the other uh, audience isn't really an audience. It's, it's really consciousness, I'd say. Um, you know, it's trying to serve a shift in consciousness, very related to what Mark was talking about, I think, which is, you know, where are we standing? Where, what you were saying, we're standing in the fire, you know? Where are we? Um, we as humans can't just blunder on without facing where we are without living into it consciously, without being changed by that, um, and, and having the, the possibility of accompanying each other, which several people have said, that, that whatever is happening here, which is so much bigger than we are, um, and, and really, um, you know, we can get into how it happened, and that's important, actually, but um, given that it is happening, how will we do this together? Um, so that's what I feel like I'm in service to and to being real with what is taking place and, and, and creating contexts where people can enter that level of reckoning with each other and, and find each other in the way that we're beginning to do here. So.
Great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we covered a lot there. Did did anything jump out at someone? Did, did you, as you heard all of the thoughts that we shared, what jumped out? You know, one thing that came to my mind uh, was, are you familiar with Ken Wilber's uh, Matrix? Um, uh, where, where you have impact? Um, Maybe not. So the, uh, it's a two by two. So if you picture it in your mind, you've got the upper left, that's internal transformation. The upper right is interpersonal impacts, working interpersonally with groups with others. The lower left is cultural change, shifts in culture, consciousness, and dynamic. And the, the lower right is structural policy kind of system. So as I was listening to you, because I was hearing whiffs of all of those dimensions going on, it just came back to me. I used to love that framework, working with that, that framework. But it, it strikes me that I want to... I kind of jump around those a bit and sometimes I think overwhelm myself with the fact that all of them are important, right? I mean, part of, but anyways, that's what came up for me when I listened to all, all of the different thoughts about who you're trying to reach and who you're working with and where you see, see change. Did anything in this conversation as you listen to people or what you had to do yourself to answer it stimulate, was this stimulating and how? Is this, is this, how is this helpful to us as a group? I was struck by um, Mark uh, and some of what you said, Marty, and some of what you said, Sarah, that, you know, we, we feel as people who know process and understand process that it can be so helpful. And yet there's, there really is this reluctance, you know, to value our work. So... I, I guess I, what do I, what do I want to say? But I just want to note that it is difficult and I, maybe I want to pat ourselves on the shoulder a little bit for hanging in there because it's not easy work. We're, we're standing in that uh, intersubjective of Ken Wilber's box and very few people understand the importance of that. They just don't understand. They don't see it. They don't recognize it. And in many ways, that's the set, that's the consciousness uh, shift that has to take place. And so even though we're not, you know, given the pats on the back very often, I think that is the box that we hold. And so, and that's something that hit me. So share and joy, yeah. Well, what struck me, Marty, is what a beautiful design you've given us that also feels like a spiral. Hmm. A <clears throat> A spiral that has a direction, but is not limited to uh, a single path there. Almost like the spaghetti strands we kept seeing across the peninsula of Florida. You remember those predictions of where the hurricane was going to go? Yeah. Oh, they call, right. them, yes. they call them spaghetti strands. I feel like we've had spaghetti strands that has been in a spiral or a vortex. So I compliment you for a beautiful design this afternoon. Well, thank you. You know, we're going to wrap up this conversation and move on to the next topic, which is going to be fantastic to hear about. It flows well. But as we close this out, is there, does, is this fruitful work? Does anybody have some ideas of a question we want to, would want to ask each other next or how we might want to pursue just talking about our work um, in the next round, is there anything that if we had time you'd want to go deeper on? Let's capture it while we're here listening and learning a little bit more about how we see our work and who we're trying to serve and the difference we're trying to make. I love the um, uh, <clears throat> frameworks and I think we should do like Wilbur's uh, framework. I think we should develop our own collection of those because uh, they certainly helped me in, in doing my work. <clears throat> Yes. Okay. Great. Any, just any other final thoughts to give us maybe some clues on other conversations we might have? Oh. 
Well, I, I think since I, since I don't work very much at the policy level, I think one conversation I wouldn't mind having is where have policy efforts been successful and how have they been successful and what might we learn in that regard? Um, I'd also be very interested um, in following up with the work that Sarah's doing at Clark in terms of how have students uh, been responding, I guess I would say, to the work you've been doing around climate there at Clark and, and also bringing in the dialogue uh, work. How, how has that been, you know, what have you learned from that? I'd be very interested in exploring that. Um, and I would also be interested, I think, Mark, weren't you wor doing something with Drawdown in Australia? Weren't you working with, um, uh, what was the organization, the uh, Pachamama doing that Drawdown work? That's Sharon Joy doing that. Yeah, sure, Joe. I know you are doing that too. I thought Mark maybe was. So I'd be interested to know how that's going. So those are some things that got my attention. Okay. Um, so maybe we'll be a little bit out of order here. Is someone willing to volunteer to facilitate the next call? We have a call in a month. I don't know that we have the date. Are we going to go back to our original time, Linda? Well, why don't we just look at that right now? Um, that would be the second. I think we were trying to Hit the second Monday, um, October. So that would be so that would be the ninth. Um, it looks like I can do it. Uh, is is it a problem for any of you? Oh boy, that's what I'm having my delicious People's Indigenous Day in the state of Florida. Oh. Oh, right. Yes, it's Columbus Day, or it used to be Columbus Day. Yeah. Oh. No. I, and in the LA, they have uh, the city council has changed the name officially. Yeah. Ah. So that so, would not work for you. No. So we could either, I mean, how many people on this call does it work for? We could either say we're going to go for it and all of us miss some, or Linda, you could do a doodle poll, or it's going to. How many people can do it on the dines? So it looks like. I can't see Mark anymore. Looks like four of us. Mark, can you do it? Did we lose Mark? I don't know. Hey, Mark. He looks, he looks frozen a bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe Mark's going to come back. So the other question is, if, if, would one of you be yeah. willing to facilitate the next meeting? And that yeah. would be <coughs> see the date. Because I think um, if we're going to own this collectively, we need to um, step up collectively to help hold the container for for us. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, Would someone be willing? It's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Mark, I, I would do it another t the next time, but I can't do it this next time because okay. of... Well, we'll make a note of that. And November looks good for Sarah, but we maybe need someone for October. Right. Well, I can do it. It's not a problem if no one else wants okay. to do it. Okay, so Linda will do October and Sarah will do November. Good. Um, so what we're going to do two more things. We're going to give, turn over the stage now to Sarah, and I'm just going to preserve a little bit time at the end, Sarah, because I do want us to do a little bit. I do want to give you do a, um, a plus Delta on this meeting just to give us some feedback. We used a new format just to give some guidance to the next facilitator. So, but Sarah, take it away. Tell us about this opportunity. I'm just realizing it looks like we did lose Mark, which is too bad. I'm sorry. Well, yeah. I, I am recording it, so he'll at least get that. Yeah, good. Well, I, I will be brief. Um, just to let everybody know that um, first Linda and I talked about this maybe a year ago, right, Linda, when we first met in person? Yep. Um, and then Linda and Marty and I explored it a little bit more. I've been working for... I guess it's now, I mean, the fifth year of um, working on this process called the Council on the Uncertain Human Future. I don't know if any of you got a chance to look at the website. Did, did some of you? Okay. Beautiful. I did. I did. Oh, yeah. Good, 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 good. Okay. Oh, there's Mark again, maybe. Is that right? Let's see. I'm seeing his, his box come up. Anyway, yeah. I hope he can come on. But in any case, so um, there he is. Hi, Mark. Oh, good. So Great. Great. Are you there, Mark? Oh, he looks frozen still. Oh, wait. There he is. Are you there? I'm back. 
I'm oh, back. you're back. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Mark, I just started talking a little bit about the Council on the Uncertain Human Future and um, the opportunity that we have to do something like this between us, if we, or we may have, I should say. Um, this is a practice that I've been doing for about five years. It came out of um, my work as a, a director of a humanities center and, and the work of creating dialogue in uh, the university. And I saw that there was, I mean, that, I won't tell you all the details of this, but I just felt strongly that there were many things we weren't saying to each other about climate. And, uh, and this is a long time ago. This is like 2011, 2012. And that we needed to create context, dialogic context, for showing up to the questions of what's truly taking place and why is it happening and what are the real implications of what's taking place and then how do we choose to conduct ourselves given what we come to know about this. And so this, this process uh, gestated within an academic setting and it, it, however, the first group that was brought together, and those of you who've seen the website will see those people, it's a, it's a national group of people across disciplines, it includes artists, it includes scientists, it includes educational leaders, um, and it was meant to be a model for this kind of conversation, this kind of reckoning. Um, and so it has grown since then, that group has continued to meet. There's a group in Edinburgh at the university. There's now, there have been four councils at Clark, the fourth one actually coming this fall, um, among faculty and staff. Um, we have had a council among the climate scientists at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, in CAR. Um, there's a group coming up this fall in Santa Fe among um, a group of women and the, the a number of these have been primarily women, all women actually, and then some of them are men and women, so that's another conversation. Um, at, anyway, there are a couple of others that are online, but Linda and I started talking about, first of all, wouldn't it be great if this group could meet in person at one point? That was what we talked about a year ago, right, Linda? Yeah. It was how good it would be to have us all in the same space together. And then we started thinking, wow, well, maybe we could do a council together, which is this deep plunge into looking at the conditions together. Now, we all think that we know what they are, but it's very different to do it in circle, obviously, to speak of it in circle, to hear and listen into the spaces between us and see what comes through. This is a traditional council process of listening into what we don't know and what the collective wisdom is between us. And it builds trust, it builds bonds, it's, um, it's very transformative in that way. And so I'm in a position with the foundation that is working with me right now on this process and has funded um, some of the additional launches of councils and reunions, I'm in a position to make an ask for us. This is just an opportunity that we have that I could put together, Linda and, and Marty or you know any of us, I mean, we can, can look at it, although I have to say I have to get a placeholder in there right away, um, to put together a request for support for us to get together to do what we're imagining would be a one session council over maybe two days or two and a half days. These are usually held in, in um, a more sequential process, either one, two or three sessions and two or three is better. Um, but with the travel involved, we're thinking that we'd be well, you know, it would be good to get one together, um, and then we could maybe do something else beyond that virtually. Um, so we'd like to submit, a, you know, a, a proposal to the Reynolds Foundation for this, uh, letting them know that all of us are people who are engaged in uh, reaching out to other circles and wanting to um, be of service at this time and also be in the process of creating 
a, a deeper level of truth telling around what's going on as well as creativity for where we are and what that might mean. There's no need for us to, to fasten on to outcomes in this kind of application. They understand that this is a, um, a process of reckoning and it does lead to collaborations. It's already done that. Um, it does lead to different kinds of creative, creative activities on the part of the people involved. And it would be, I think, very um, interesting to Reynolds to do it for us because of the range of access and, and um, engagement that this group already has um, with other kinds of uh, institutional groups and activities all the way from faith-based organizations to policy-based organizations. So they have taken a leap and have been helping me make this happen more widely. And so we're in a position where we could be one of those groups. This is not going to be a huge, I'm not, how, how do you say, right now this is a small network you know, there are seven groups so far. Um, I do think that it could become something that, that spreads in, in fact, we're talking about working with high schools right now. Um, and we have one high school that we're getting involved with out in Western Mass. Um, so it could be viral. It definitely has that potential. Um, it has existing agendas that are simple, but hold to the intentional conversation and format of council. Um, and so we would use those with some tweaks as we needed to have. And that would be, you know, I would facilitate with either Linda or Marty or both or something like that. Um, but it's a very simple, no, nobody will be surprised by or thrown out by the, by the sort of process part of it. It's really that, it creates a space for something very unusual to happen. So that's probably enough from me. Yeah. So yeah. So we just wanted. There's so many questions of clarity that you have, and then I think we kind of want to see if people, if this is helping you at all. So anybody have questions for Sarah on to get clearer on what this is? Mark. I can't see Mark for some reason, so oh. let's see if you can. I can, I I can see him. he is on my screen. Oh, there, there he is. Okay, yeah. So did you have a question, Mark? Oh, yes. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, th thanks, Sarah. Your description sounds wonderful. Uh, um, I, I think that for me, I'm just a bit unclear about what's the unique in the process of the council the the topic i think the council for the uncertain future i think that's a really compelling description but is there anything actually unique in the process that stands out well i'm not sure what you mean by unique but it's it's a very um sort of classic way of council process which means that we agree, we make very simple agreements of sharing time and um, uh, speaking from the heart, um, listening respectfully, um, confidentiality. Um, and so we, we go around the circle with a talking piece, basically. So it's, it's the most uber sort of simple version of a council practice. But of course, we know that that is very, very helpful. I mean, that just opens up um, people's sense of trust. It gives people, you know, they're not uh, performative in the same ways that we often are. Does that answer your question? Is that kind of what you're looking at? Yeah, I, I think it, it's, it's often the simplest description. I suppose in a way, um, you know, if we looked at our practice in this circle, you know, how is it different? Uh, than this and um, you know what does what's the special attention that we attend to in honoring what you're trying to achieve so that you know I can really understand that space well it becomes a little bit more of a sacred space because you 
you know, definitely are sitting together, first of all, you're in, you're in circle, literally, you're passing the talking piece. So it, there is a way in which it becomes a little bit more of a ritual. Um, and the questions are, are carefully crafted, but they're very simple. So it's a chance for something to happen, a kind of collective reckoning, and then moving into a space of exploring where do we go from that reckoning that we don't usually give ourselves the time to do. So it's a time aside, if that makes sense. It's a, it's a time apart where there's a deep plunge that becomes possible. Does that help? That's very helpful, Sarah. That's a lovely description. And I think the simplicity and power of that description is, is what uh, stands for its uniqueness, even though that can be created in other spaces. That's what this really stands for, this process. So that's a lovely description. Okay. And I think that any of us could, from that experience, possibly share it in other group settings. I, I would imagine that that's why your funder would be interested in us possibly doing it. Well, I do think that's, that is hope, a hope. It wouldn't have to be the case. No. We wouldn't have to, I mean, people might or might not find that it serves their own work, right? right. Um, but it's certainly all of these um, councils have been generative in, un, in surprising ways. Mm -hmm. And so obviously bringing those of us together who are people who think about facilitation and working with conversation, I mean, deepening and intentional conversation, um, it would be hoped that there, that would have impact beyond our own circle. But even if it changes us individually, you know, is a lot. Yeah, so. absolutely. So we, so the, uh, the offer is, I think that both Linda and I are very interested. And we just, I think we're seeing if there's other people that have been part of this DD can process that would be willing to make this commitment. It would happen sometime next year, right? If it if it happens, right? We could decide when it could happen, and we also can open it up to others that are not in this group. We would want about twelve people, mm -hmm. we think, and so we could think uh, collectively and individually about who else we might want to invite to be part of the circle. And please, there's no pressure for anybody to participate. I mean, everybody needs to know that. that so do you want to give some indication now, Sarah, in this call? Or do you want people to be in touch with you? I mean, what's... what's? I don't... I, I think, Marty... Sorry? No, I said there's just a few people on the call, so I don't know what you want, how you'd like to... Well, it really isn't... You know, this is just something generated between us that is an opportunity. So I don't have, what I would say from here is that if anybody, we, we were just interested to know if we thought among us that there would be some interest, right? And if so, we would apply for this in this next round of funding that I'm putting together. Um, we know that Linda and Marty and I are interested in doing it, but we'd hope that obviously others of you might be interested in joining as well. Yeah. And of course, yeah. there's a lot of people not on the call. What is, what is your time frame, Sarah, for um, getting a proposal in? Um, I'm going to submit something to the director in the next few days, actually, that's that I would put a placeholder in. And the final um, proposal has to be in by October 1st. Okay. Well, so why don't... Um, I'm fine being the point person to just see who is interested and then maybe Marty and you and I can, and whoever else wants to come into this, maybe we can have some conversations about who else we might want to invite in. Uh, does that make sense? Yes. And we don't need to know any of that soon. I mean, it would be nice to know if there were six of us or four or, you know, whatever that were interested, but we don't have to worry about who else would be included and, until later. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Mark. Um, I'm feeling uh, you're creating a safe place, Sarah, for us not to make any comment or commitment about it. But, but can I just say, it, this is a fantastic project. 
Uh, uh, the more we have of this in the world, the better off we'd all be. So I, I can see for me no reticence uh, that we don't. It's a wonderful gift that you're offering and I'd love to be there. Um, I'm halfway across the planet, so I don't think that's a realistic uh, expectation. But, um, you know, it's this type of conversation and process that I think is the hub of what we're talking about. I'd love to see more of it happening. So bring it on. Yay. Great. Great. Yeah, I would love to be part of it also. Oh, great, great Jim. Sure. Good, 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 good. Yeah. All right, well, then I, I'll, I'll just reach out to the others, explain about it, and, um, you know, get back with the initial um, interest from our group, and then maybe we can schedule another meeting between those of us who are interested and figure out, you know, who's the wider, who are the other invites that we might reach out to. Let me just say to Mark, Mark, if you are willing to fly over, maybe we could figure out how to fund that. So don't rule it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, there are some of us who've been back and forth to Australia. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you make it the other way? Great. Well, and there's a lot of us in the, well, a lot of you guys, although they're not on the phone right now, that are in the north, uh, northeast. Well, Jim, you're one. So some of you wouldn't have that much travel at all. So. Maybe it'll all balance out. Thank you all. Very yeah, nice. thank you, sir. Great opportunity. So we're just about at the close, and I, I would like us to just spend a moment, and this isn't fishing for, you know, pats on the back or anything. I just think that we should take a moment and say, in terms of the, having a structured meeting, this is only one example of how we could do it, but it was a more structured meeting. I'd just like to get some feedback of, you know, what worked for you and any suggestions or ideas we have about meetings going forward. So if we could just capture a couple comments that might be on the top of our head about, you know, what worked here today um, that you liked, and then we can move on to some suggestions for the future. So anyone have anything concrete they want to say about what worked for them about our time together? I love the structure and the leadership. Okay. Anything else in particular or specific to give guidance to anyone going forward, you know, on what we're doing? Well, I definitely, yes, yeah, sorry, Linda, go ahead. Um, I think we should definitely keep the personal check-ins because we hadn't always done that before. And I do think that's important. Um, and I do like having a sense for uh, knowing what the agenda is. So I think by rotating it, we'll get a chance to, um, you know, see what other subjects come up and other, other ways of, of going about it. But I, I thought this was, I thought it worked really well, Marty. You facilitated really well. So Sarah, did you have a, a comment on that that you were starting to no, say? I'm just going to say I completely agree with Jim about liking um, the structure, um, the questions very much. Um, you're, you're obviously a wonderful facilitator. Yeah. <laughs> so just the way, the way that you've brought us together. And also I just appreciate everybody's contributions. I feel as though we really shift <laughs> to a level, a different level of connection. So thank you all very much. Any ideas or suggestions that we just want to get down on paper to, uh, to help us think of ideas going forward? Other things, suggestions that could improve this or would be an optional approach? I like the idea, uh, excuse me, I like the idea of the homework, uh, looking at Sarah's uh, website. That was very helpful. Having homework, great. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Actually, for me, um, one of the things that strikes, like the, the process is, you know, it seems, I don't know you all that well, but the process of uh, groups like this is usually um, quite good. You know, I think um, the attention to detail about what we're trying to hold. But what, what was unique for me is actually the work that was done behind the scenes by Marty for you to, to take hold of um, facilitating a structure. And also for Sarah to um, offer the gift of her process. And so to me, it would, groups go through ebbs and flows of um, being connected and coordinated and focused and sort of a bit loose and uh, unstructured. And 
and they have a life. So in a way it gets back to purpose, you know, like if we turn up, what, what's our, what's our purpose. And when there, when there's a strong purpose that um, holds us together, that, that works really well. But, but sometimes the intensity of that needs some space to chill out as well. So there's a, an ebbing and flowing and all of that. And I can see there's a sort of what I'm feeling is a bit of a sort of coming together on some focus and activity and some purpose. But I'm also aware that that might, that might dissipate later on, depending on what, what we're holding together. So then it just says to me is what, what's the life of this group and um, you know, how, how's it, uh, who's in and who's out and what's it trying to achieve in the world? That sort of stuff starts to come up. What I'm experiencing from my, um, my variety of uh, groups that I've been a part of is what we're evolving into is a learning community. That's a term that we use. Where it's a place to be uh, honest and as you said, Mark, uh, to serve our personal integrity. Mm-hmm. And for many people that are out there, that's not often available. So having learning communities where you feel uh, you've met the stranger and they don't live as a stranger, but as a, a learning partner, willing to give feedback, I think is, um, as, as was described, I think in your council, an intentional conversation that is rare and valued. Mm -hmm. wow. Okay, so any other comments on the meeting or anything before we say farewell for today? Did Mark have something? Yeah, well, just just as Sharon Joy said that, in a way, what, what we haven't really negotiated with each other, but what starts to happen when we do this intentionally is what's the norms that we operate as a group um, and the commitments that we make to each other. So that, that's, uh, that's another thing that we haven't um, agreed, but that's the direction that we're heading in. Uh, Yes, and there's this whole, this is the second iteration of this network. We called ourselves the kitchen cabinet this time, and I, we kind of did have a charge to kind of figure out what are we? <laughs> so I think we're still unfolding into that and, and feeling our way. But this is a discussion that we could, you know, that we might be ready to, we're kind of living our way into it rather than trying to mentally frame it and define it, I, I think. But we can change that up at any moment, you know, and try to make it more intentional. Um, uh, Mark, you kind of froze up for a while there. Um, and I just want to hold out the possibility. Um, we wondered who might like to facilitate next time. And I'm kind of getting this buzz all over me that maybe if you, if you would be willing to facilitate, maybe we could like move kind of into that norm uh, area. It seems like that's dead on. Is that something you'd be comfortable with? Um, yeah, I, I suppose I just haven't got a quite sense when the next one's on and if I'm available. But uh, may, maybe maybe I could do the one after the next one, or, or just I just sort of need to know in advance so that because one of the things for me and is and it's a norm about how we work together is the commitments that I make to right. you and about my personal integrity. So. I'd be reluctant to make uh, something now because I know a lot of people intend to make commitments and we run groups in ways that uh, people take up a commitment but they don't deliver on it and, and it, it, it saps the energy out of our work together. So I like the way that Sarah and Marty brought their commitments about what they were standing for to this meeting and that's got a lot of integrity so I would like to do it in the same way as well. Well, the next meeting is October 9th. Uh, if that's something you could do. I think we lost you when we sent, when we sent that date out. Yeah. Let me just have a look at my diary. Uh, it would be the morning of the 10th for you. 
Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm out that day. So, yeah, I can't even make the meeting that day. Well, you know what I think I'll do? Um, and I, I don't know. It, it, this is maybe I just put this to the group quickly. Is it better that we always do it at the same time, even if some of us can't make it? Or is it better that I put out a poll or whoever's going to facilitate, just put out a poll that for that week and then we, we determine what's the best? How do people feel about that? I like, <clears throat> I like choice number two. Me too. Uh, and, and, okay. Uh, okay, yeah. well then I will put out a poll, a doodle poll for that week. And, um, and Mark, if you are available, I'll just, we'll just go back and forth. I, I had volunteered to facilitate next time. So we'll just talk, you know, if that's something that you can do and who knows what day, what, what day it'll be. So. Thank you, Linda, for doing that. Yeah. For both willing to hold the space and also put out the poll and then work with Mark on it. Cause I think that sounds like a good plan. Okay. Thank you so much for facilitating Marty. It's yeah. really, really You're welcome. Lovely. Yeah, it was it was it was really great, and I got some of my needs out there, so it was good. Yay! Sharon Joy looks like she was. Saying. Yes, I really want to say thank you to your crickets, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I felt they just offered a tremendous uh, chorus of applause throughout the whole thing. I agree. <laughs> it's, I it, it's trying to mate with my hearing aid. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's I great. love it. Oh, I love it. Okay, everyone. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. All right. Bye. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. See you next time. Bye. 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 See you next time. <laughs>